The Auburn Tigers missed on what was once seen as an Auburn lock, Keldrick Falk. So what now? Well, Zach, I, I actually just finished crushing some chicken farm, and I am, I am freaking ready to rock and roll. You are Locked On Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Blackerby, and thank you so much for making Locked On Auburn your first listen every single day. It is a recruiting Thursday, and I'd like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the entire Locked On College Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn dot com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply let's bring in john garcia of uh locked on recruiting insider and of course the man over at sports illustrated covering all things football recruiting john the keldrick falk ripped the hearts out of a lot of auburn fans <laughs> early um earlier this week what was your response to that and you know where does auburn you know where does auburn look next for their potential next uh their next target yeah that was certainly a, a bit of a surprise although you know we heard that florida state was really in the thick of this race they got yeah. the last official visit on top of that and, and there was certainly some seminal momentum but there's no doubt that uh, a semi-local prospect like that these are the initial targets you want to keep home we've talked about it all year with auburn now they started the month by doing so right with jeremiah cobb carmelo english but obviously defensively you wanted to try to secure a promising edge prospect whose best football is well ahead of him keldrick plays basketball he plays right. offense as well so really has not assimilated into the prospect we think he'll be at the next level so certainly a big loss for auburn but again luckily for everyone in this class of 2023 the, the state of alabama is loaded there's a lot of elite defensive line prospects in particular that's the strongest position group in the state probably by a wide margin uh, so there are certainly other prospects out there uh, to court uh, and of course they'll do so beyond state lines as well um, but obviously you know the dominoes at that position certainly point you to Quay Rousseau he becomes much more important for the Tigers I do think of the Montgomery duo him and James Smith I think Rousseau is higher on Auburn at this point they, they've talked about playing together but you know, in recruiting, that doesn't always work out. So I do think that if there's one uh, elite edge target in state uh, that's still on the board, it would be Quay Rousseau uh, for the Tigers. And others will, again, continue to emerge. We still have the rest of the offseason and the 2022 season. I know we're going to talk about some late risers later today. So sure. there could be some potentially emerging uh, along the defensive front as well. But in terms of the known long-term targets, Rousseau is, is easily – the most important available defensively for the Tigers uh, the rest of the way. Yeah, and you talk about Russo being one of the big guys in the state. I mean, nationally, he's yes. I mean, he is a a prize prize recruit. 100%. I mean, he's he's one of the twitchier edge prospects that we've seen. I mean, heck, the first time I saw him, he was showing me video on his phone of him running like a 1099 100 meter dash. I mean, it, it's kind of absurd when you think of, you know, 64 240 running like that but that's what these pass rushers are becoming that's why Trevon Walker went number one in the draft I mean these these freaky right. edge prospects really do change how you uh, prepare for a defense on offense and obviously how you scheme your own defense defensively and, and that's why they're so coveted sure all right so since we last spoke uh, you mentioned Auburn recruiting trending up Jeremiah Cobb Committed, of course, the the running back. I think he's going to be a star. I think you do, too, uh, from Montgomery. He committed this past Friday. And then on July 4th, Carmelo English, the talented wide receiver from the Central Phoenix City. Adding those two offensive pieces, what does it mean for this class? Well, I think optically it means a ton. I mean, this is this – is, it's kind of like when Harson took over, there's like two things that immediately came to mind. One, upgraded offensive recruiting, and, and that might still be TBD. But two, it was like, keep local recruits home. I mean, Gus Malzani company did a great job, but that was really the, the main recruiting, besides offensive tackles, that was the main recruiting negative, was like, can you recruit Montgomery? What about Auburn Obelika? What about Phoenix City into Columbus, Georgia? That whole triangle, if you will. 
that was checked in a huge way early in July with these two verbal commitments. And I think on top of that, getting a Central Phoenix City kid is a big deal. Uh, yeah. I do know, you know, I'm familiar with that community. I do know kind of an Auburn contingent that was like, will Coach Patrick Nix send a player to Auburn? And look, Pat is great. He's been around forever. If anyone understands the business side of all of this, it's him. Sure. He's not going to hold that grudge. But still, it's one of those until it happens, you kind of never know. Uh, and, and it obviously happened. So I do think optically huge, huge news for Auburn. And then two really good players on top of that. Like you said, Jeremiah Cobb is a superstar. I think he's a three down back. He's built today for the collegiate game. Yeah. You can give it to him in between the tackles. You certainly can utilize him in space and out of the backfield as a receiver. He's already checked all those boxes. Head-to-head -head win versus Clemson for a kid they really wanted. That's another huge optical mm -hmm. check mark there. And then with English, a productive physical wide receiver who's got a little bit of juice. He's a punt returner. He plays inside and outside. There's some polish within his game. Some of the, the elements that we really need to see on that Auburn wide receiver core that, um, you know, is, is looked at as kind of a weakness going into 2022. So satisfying a great position of need like wide receiver and then winning a monster head-to-head -head battle with the Clemson Tigers, I think is optically as, as good as it could have gone aside from landing Brock Glenn at this point. Those sure. two were about the, the next best things for Auburn. So to get them back to back, I thought was huge. And, and this class, John, I mean, obviously you want more than four guys, but all four of the guys in this class, the two we just mentioned, and Terrence Love, the defensive back from Georgia, Braden Joyner, the, the four-star offensive guard, they're, they're all unanimous four stars across all of the scouting services. I mean, as far as the quality goes, Auburn has four really, really good players that could start, they have a path to playing time to start in their first two seasons on the Plains, which I think is is huge, but you need more of these guys. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. You have to have more. Um, and all those guys bring a lot of varsity experience already. I think that's yeah. another critical element of guys playing early. Talent is, of course, a part of that. But, you know, have you already shown up on the biggest stages? And obviously Montgomery Catholic's gone on huge runs. Central Phoenix City was in the state title game at, at the 7A level last year. Um, Auburn High School, of course, uh, another program that has, has been to the Super 7. So uh, I think you're getting a lot of experience on top of that pure talent in state. Uh, so those are, those are again, two big boxes to check for, for the Tigers. But, yeah, you definitely need more volume here going forward. Another in-state and local prospect that I think is interesting, um, we will talk about him with John in just a moment. Today's show is brought to you by rockauto.com. You can save time and money when using rockauto.com. Why choose to spend more money and go out of your way to buy automobile parts for your car, truck, or SUV at your local store or your car dealership? Just go straight to rockauto.com right now. And uh, you don't have to deal with questioning. It's super easy to use their website. I know nothing about cars, and I can navigate their website very easily. Just check it all out at rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car, truck, or SUV. Right? Locked on Auburn in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, and all the parts your car will ever need. That is at rockauto.com. John Garcia, I want to talk next about J.C. Hart, 6'2", 175-pound cornerback from Lochapoca. So another local kid. He picked up an offer, and as soon as Auburn offered this kid, you saw crystal balls flying in saying, hey, watch this guy. This kid's probably going to be a member of Auburn's class. There's not a whole lot out there about him. What little bit of tape that's out there that I've seen, I really like it. Um, what are you hearing about J.C. Hart? Kind of the same thing, right? I mean, he's so hyper-local. Uh, again, we talked about that optical focus that that needed to, to be accomplished yeah. by this staff. And I think it, it works in two ways. It works with the established names we, we know and have talked about forever, right? The Rusals, the James Smiths, the Jeremiah Cobbs, et cetera. But also you have to have this self-awareness and continued evaluation to follow up on the emergers. Some of Auburn's best defensive backs in particular, Roger McCreary immediately comes to mind, were late risers, guys that we weren't really talking Daniel about Thomas. as sophomores and right. juniors. Roger okay. McCreary was quarterback, right? I mean, that was a late pre-signing day offer. I think he was committed to South Alabama. So you do have to continue to evaluate. And um, Hart came to camp, crushed it, legitimately 6'1 and a half, 6'2", 
long rangy defensive back who plays all over the field. Yeah, it's against lesser and smaller competition, but you need to see flashes of dominance when you do go down to that level. And he provides that um, on offense, defense, and special teams. So I do think that there's a lot of intrigue there. And I do think when you do it at camp, it, it validates things quicker. It just does. And that's sure. why it, it's not just Auburn jumping in on this kid, right? Other programs have pushed Mississippi State, Vanderbilt. I mean, this kid's from one month to the next, May to June, became an SEC prospect. I mean, it's kind of a beautiful story. But, you know, now you do have to close there. And I do think kids like that understand their rise and understand that there's kind of a window. There's kind of a window that you got to jump in on. Um, and I do think that uh, that will play well uh, for the Tigers. Uh, this is one, again, position um, and grouping that they've been really excellent at as evaluators and developers, which is really hard to do. Uh, so, so they do certainly trust their evaluations in the secondary. And I do think uh, that will help propel them forward in, in this recruitment, all things even. Now, other schools get involved or the kid wants to take his time. Maybe we'll see. Um, but all indication is is the visits are done. The camps are done. Yeah, It's a dead period right now. It's kind of a matter of when and not if, in my mind, for Auburn to, to land this kid. And I think on the front end, it'll look like not the best grab nationally. He's, I don't know where he's ranked by others, but it will grow. <laughs> Nehemiah Pritchett, Pritchett was a three-star when he committed. Roger McCreary, same deal. Um, and this is something that Auburn has, again, that's that's not the position to worry about from a coaching staff evaluation and a talent acquisition perspective. So um, I, I think that'd be a great get. And you can't teach those measurables and that playmaking ability. I think he's he's got a little bit more Nehemiah Pritchett in his game to me at, at the same stage. Um, and I think that's a, a great find for Auburn if, if they could reel him in. Yeah, when, when you go to his pages on different services, it's all about like, okay, you see the offers and it's like, it's Auburn, Missouri, Alabama State, then you know some other smaller schools. And it's like, okay, yeah, this looks like a guy that's either a three-star or unrated on, on some services. But then you look at his size and his size, you mentioned the measurables there multiple times. And it's like, that stands out. That's, that doesn't match with the rest of this. Those long arms, and that physical mentality uh, of the little bit that, that I've been able to see, but a legitimate six, two and like, he's being overlooked. I mean, this seems like Auburn may have found somebody. I, I really like this kid, John. Me too. And I think the only question I had after watching some highlights were yeah. his top end speed, but Auburn had him at camp. So guess what? 40 yard dash short right. shuttle, a ton of one-on-ones. I've been to about 50 Auburn camps. They get after it. So that box, even if, like me, they were curious, and they have more access to me and resources, obviously. Sure. If they were still curious about that, they were able to answer that question while they extended that scholarship offer. It's not something that you – when you offer local recruits, it matters, right? Um, you can't really kind of limp into that, if that makes sense. You have to push. You have to push for a local prospect when you do offer that scholarship. And oftentimes, Zach, that green light has to be attached to it. Because you can't just play optics with local recruits because, uh, especially in this case, which is unique, you know, Auburn really has to be careful with local schools. I mean, the, the whole Auburn high school thing is, you know, well documented. Sure. Um, so they've gotten over that hump. They can't start to go the other way with other schools. So I do think validating that performance at camp, regardless of if they think he's a safety or corner, I think that was really important before extending that scholarship offer. So I do think it's a safer bet. And I do believe he has that green light to commit. J.C. Hart, definitely uh, definitely a guy to keep an eye out for Auburn folks. Uh, let's talk about D.J. Chester, 6'5", 300-pound offensive tackle from McDonough, Georgia. Uh, I opened up in, in my Discord, Locked on Auburn Discord. You can join that in the link down below. I'm like, all right, who, who do we want to hear John talk about? And they're like, well, there's really only one other blue chip offensive tackle that we're in for, so let's ask about D.J. Chester. What uh, What are your thoughts on him? What an interesting uh, offensive line recruit here. Um, uh, like you said, a blue chip tackle, certainly 6'5". I think he's listed at 300. Looks a little bigger to me, but he carries it pretty well. Uh, and I just love that he plays all over the line. You know, he plays left tackle. He plays right tackle. Kind of a run-heavy offense down at Elka. You know, Eagles Landing Christian. Uh, yeah. They've been for, for a very long time, smaller private school. But, man, he's a people mover. <laughs> and, and I think at the end of the day, you can work with that regardless of where that position projection may take him. I think DJ has a, a right tackle or guard floor 
But depending on how you reshape the body and, and work into some pass protection development, I think he could have a left tackle ceiling depending on how the next couple of years go. Uh, so I could see why he's become almost overnight. You know, it, it was a regional recruitment and then it became kind of a national recruitment that started stretching further than, than, than that SEC, ACC footprint. Uh, but I do think he's going to stay a little bit closer to home. You know, McDonough's not Atlanta. So I do think that, you know, those kids are, are more likely to stay uh, near or, or in the immediate area, if at all possible. So I do think it was good for Auburn to get him on campus a couple times, including for that mid-June official visit. Uh, it does seem like, though, he's kind of taking his time. I don't think there is a verbal commitment date out there, uh, at least that I found just yet. Yeah. So it's one of those where you're kind of curious about, one, will he get back to campus? I don't know if there's a an, a non-football type of recruiting event at the end of July. There's a small visit window uh, for schools to utilize there. And then, of course, it's, it's fall camp for everyone. So you wonder if his recruitment pushes into the fall, does he get back to the Plains uh, for a game day visit? But the, the kid said he loved it. I mean, when you yeah. use the word love, I know these are teenagers, but it, it hits different, right? So I do think that um, Auburn's in a good spot at this point. Again, just unsure of his timeline. Uh, but look, optically, there's there's no Georgia, Alabama involved. Uh, so I do think that's a good thing for the Tigers. And if he does start to, you know, kind of just hang out during this dead period and, and wake up one day and say, hey, maybe I need to get this thing over with a little bit sooner. I think that'd be great news uh, for the Tigers relative to their competition, especially with the need that they have at tackle. I mean, it's we, we talk about it every week, it feels like. Uh, so if he's the last blue chip guy remaining, uh, he, he's really critical. Uh, ahead of, uh, of of a potential verbal commitment. Yeah, give him whatever he wants. Yeah. Now the yeah. that that window at the end of July, you know, Auburn's using it for their their Big Cat weekend. That's okay. returning now that that's available, and they couldn't do it last year because of COVID stuff. So uh, obviously, you want DJ Chester, you want JC Hart, you want everybody as many people as possible on campus um, for that. But yeah, DJ Chester, I was watching some of his stuff, John, and like he's pretty technically sound. For uh, I guess this would have been his junior tape. So I mean. He doesn't waste a whole lot of steps, which for a big guy, every step needs to count. And he seems to play that way. And the fact that he plays in different spots on the offensive line is pretty, that's pretty unique. 100%. 100%. He, you know, in a run based offense, there's kind of a negative connotation around it when we're talking about offensive linemen. But when it's so run heavy that you're moving around, you're pulling, you're chipping to the second level, you're the lead blocker out in space it actually projects more athletically than one of these air raid offenses where these kids are just zone blocking and pass protection every single play, mining the inside gap and kind of checking on the outside. This kid's more so on the move where he's hitting moving and, and honestly much smaller targets than he is in space. So I do think it creates a higher ceiling for, for prospects like that. Cause when you do translate it over to pass protection, you're a little bit more equipped for those smaller twitchier pass rushers. Like we talked about, at the top of the show because that's what that position is becoming. So if you're going to play tackle, you've got to be able to, to redirect and really give ground despite being, you know, the biggest guy on the field. And we do see that a lot with DJ's tape. All right. Yeah. So DJ Chester, uh, another offensive tackle for Auburn folks to keep an eye out on uh, another name that Auburn fans are constantly checking for updates on Twitter and social media is Brock Lynn. And John was with him all last week at the Elite 11. So we'll get John's thoughts on the latest regarding Auburn's quarterback target for this class. But first, got to tell you about Built Bar. Coconut brownie chunk puffs. They are available at Built.com. And um, they say they taste like an Almond Joy. Like I said before, I'm not a huge coconut fan. They've got a ton of different flavors. But from the folks that have invented healthy and tasty comes their latest gift to your taste buds. Uh, you've probably tried the Coconut Brownie Chunk Built Bar. It's one of their best sellers, but now you can get it in a puff. So the way to do that is go Built.com. Use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. That is promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off. That is at Built.com. John Garcia, our guest, you thought we were going to go a full conversation without me bringing up Brock Lynn. I think you thought you were going to get out of here without having to talk about Brock Lynn. But not you. all joke inside, you were uh, you were at the Elite 11 out in L.A., so was he. I think you guys ranked him as the ninth, the ninth best performer of the 20 guys out there. One, you know, what did you see from Brock Lynn? And then two, in your conversations, um, what, what can Auburn fans kind of expect as far as timetable and, and everything that goes along with that? 
Yeah, Brock looked great, Zach. I mean, this is something that we've come to expect, uh, seeing him once again. There's a steadiness to his game that that every quarterback needs to have. But I really just, the more I saw him, the more I liked him on the move. And I think that's where you kind of modernize it, right? I think we talk about these, these pocket SEC quarterbacks that are accurate and efficient, and it kind of sounds boring to a lot of people. But then we see Glenn working more and more on the move, whether it's the pro day, which is a 20 throw script uh, that is really built to be difficult. Or uh, on the third day, it was a combination of like an accuracy gauntlet where you had to move and hit stationary targets and then seven on seven. And Glenn is just running around so comfortably. He's so balanced. He squares up so very well that he finished, you know, the the event better than he started. Uh, I think he was second for us on the final day during that accuracy gauntlet challenge where we charted like 500 throws that day. Glenn, Glenn was the second best by a very small margin. So I think there's just a lot of modern ability in his game, along with this classic kind of quarterback demeanor and and balance uh, that you really like at the position. Um, and I think that's why his recruitment is not over yet. I, I think teams yeah. are still like, man, this kid's really good. And LSU was was kind of the latest scholarship offer right before he took off to L.A. I believe the LSU jumped in and, you know, he just kind of said, look, I can't commit right now. I just I can't do it like I wanted to ahead of the Elite 11 finals. So he ends up holding off, or he's still uncommitted as, as far as I know today. And he wants to vet LSU a little bit. Now he took all five of his visits, so he can't take an official. And obviously it's a dead period right now. So he's like, hey, I'm gonna jump in a bunch of Zooms with LSU and just kind of give them a chance. Um, and, and I think that's understandable from a recruiting standpoint. You have to do your due diligence here. Brock Glenn, barring, a catastrophe or coaching changes, et cetera, he's going to commit and be done, right? He's not going to be one of these flippable quarterbacks. So I do think he wants to do all the due diligence on the front end. He's already visited Ohio State, Florida State, Auburn, of course, Mississippi State still in there. Uh, but I do think the LSU offer without being able to visit has slowed him down. Now he said, I still want to do it as soon as I can. So he still has the ASAP label out there, but it just isn't, an immediate label. Uh, so it's as soon as possible after he can vet LSU and just give them their due diligence. But uh, again, I do still think this is more of, of an Auburn and Ohio State situation. Florida State is is a little bit of a dark horse here. I, I'm okay. starting to hear more about the Seminoles. Uh, he was he he was recruited by them uh, last year, and then it kind of died down when their OC went to Oregon, Kenny Dillingham, who, who you guys know sure. very well. Right. And then it died down a little bit, but then it picked back up under Mike Norvell this year when they decided they wanted to take two quarterbacks. I believe he was the first scholarship offer they sent out beyond their current commitment. And I think that mattered a lot to Brock. So FSU is a bit of a dark horse here, but this is still, to me, more of an Auburn, Ohio State situation after taking those official visits. Um, no disrespect to LSU. I just don't see how, without a visit, the Tigers can really – make up that ground on the Auburn Tigers and, and that intrigue of, of potentially being one of the next guys up at Ohio State. So I still do think the ball is, is in those two schools as collective court. And I do still think Auburn's in a great spot here, but you certainly, from an anxiety perspective, you want him to pop sooner rather than later if you're a fan of, of, of the school on the planes, for sure. Well, and if you're a, a member of this Auburn coaching staff, you probably want to know so you can say, okay, well, I guess we need to go find another quarterback, right? Hundred percent. There's there are some quarterbacks emerging. Um, that, even at the Elite Eleven, there were some unheralded guys that really stepped up. Emory Williams, the kid from the Panhandle, uh, the Tulane commitment was like a late replacement for Nico Iamaliava, and he's got uh, LSU recruiting him now too. So that could be looked at as good news for Auburn if LSU is already moving on to other quarterback targets. So I do think that yeah, there's there's a group of, of qu quarterbacks beyond Glenn that are serviceable. It's a great deep year at the position, but among the best available, it's Dante Moore and it's Brock Glenn. And there's probably a bit of a gap there. And I think teams that are clamoring to land one of those two guys. And you, that's why you see both of them almost overwhelmed. Right. I mean, and schools coast to coast on top of that. So I do think that it's making things tougher on just about everyone. But I do believe Glenn in particular I do think he comes off the board in the next couple of weeks. I don't see this extending too much beyond the month of July. I definitely don't see it extending into the season in particular. If it does, 
then I do think Auburn has to start cycling back and at least communicating right. with a bigger group of prospects. But we don't have any other names at this point. So I do think that's a good sign for the Tigers and where their confidence is today with their top guy. John Garcia, thank you so much for your time. As always, my friend, how can people check out all the stuff you've got going on at SI? Yeah, real simple, si.com slash college. Uh, check us out on social, John Garcia underscore JR. Yep, easy as that, and you will not be disappointed with his coverage over there. Thank you so much for tuning in. You can find all my written work at auburndaily.com, and we will be joined tomorrow by Justin Ferguson with the Auburn Observer for a little Ferg Friday action. This has been Locked on Auburn.